So today we have S. <laughs> Brett Rodriguez Plate. He's a professor at Hamilton College in the Department of Religion. He's a scholar of the interplay between religion and the senses. And Professor Plate's work is interdisciplinary, moving between developments in cultural anthropology, art history, film studies, and cognitive science, along with religious studies. He's the author, among other things, of Blasphemy, Art That Offends, The Religion and Film Reader, and A History of Religion in Five and a Half Objects. And I have to admit that I don't normally troll Facebook looking for guest speakers, <laughs> but I was so intrigued when a friend posted Professor Plate's article on the Erie Canal and the birth of American religion. And since it fitted in so nicely to our heretics theme, I just had to get in touch with him. So <laughs> I'm thrilled this morning to be able to introduce you to Brent Rodriguez Plate, who will kick off this semester's Heretics Club series. Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Dina. Thanks for the invite to be here and privilege to kick off the uh, year's uh, events. Hopefully this will be a good kind of introduction to many of the other community uh, speakers who will be coming here in the next several weeks. Um, I began to move to upstate New York about 10 years ago. I'm from the West Coast originally, and so the Erie Canal to me was just right, something about uh, a mule named Sal and 40 miles and things like that. I really had no idea what this was. Uh, so as I got here and began traveling around, I began to realize what a central thing this was for um, uh, 19th, 19th century religious life. But as I began to look at it, it really was this, this generative ground for so much that happened and actually became what I would argue is the American religion. Uh, it, much of it happened and was uh, created here, uh, right here in this area. So I'll uh, give a little introduction to that here today. If you drive into Palmyra, New York, uh, you'll see a site not unlike what Mormon founder Joseph Smith found 200 years ago, a, a cluster of steeples from the four Protestant churches. Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, and Episcopalians confront each other on adjacent corners in the town's crossroads. These aren't the same steeples as in Smith's day, but the interdenominational face-off was already in force when Smith was there. Joseph Smith reflected, he said, there is in this place where we lived an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. Priests contended against priest and convert against convert so that all their good feelings, one for another, were entirely lost in a strife of words and a contest about opinions. In a newly settled land, rife with uh, religious movements and direct competition for people's souls, Smith turned this discord into his advantage, and as is well known through contemporary caricature and uh, acclaim alike, he forged one of the most powerful religious traditions operating in the world today. But what isn't so well known is that the origins of Mormonism, like the origins of many religious practices and beliefs in the United States, are deeply bound up with the birth of the Erie Canal. Palmyra actually is situated on the canal, 15 miles south of Lake Ontario and 20 miles east of Rochester. Smith's family moved from New England to the Palmyra area in 1817 uh, when he was 12 years old, and this was the same exact year, 200 years ago, right now, that the uh, Erie Canal was begun. Uh, they dug it between Utica and Rome. That was the first section that was opened uh, in 1817. By 1823, the Erie Canal was opened between Palmyra and Rochester, and it established the outpost as a regional commercial center. Prosperity grew along with the population. In another two years, the canal would stretch the entire 363 miles from Albany to Buffalo, creating economic boom towns along the way and generating ex spiritual excitation and experimentation as settlers moved further from the church authorities of the East. Now in 1827, Smith tells us, he found the golden plates with ancient inscriptions on them in nearby Hill Cumorah. And I was talking with Dina earlier. We've been out uh, with some colleagues. Been out to the uh, Hilcomora pageant uh, every summer. They hold they hold out in um, uh, outside of Palmyra in Manchester, New York. A big Hilcomora pageant that sort of reenacts the uh, Book of Mormon. Get a different version than the than the Broadway version uh, that you might see. With the help of some close colleagues, of course, we know Joseph Smith set to translating these into what became the Book of Mormon. And around that time, a printing press was shipped to Palmyra from New York City by canal boat. By 1830, 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon were printed in Egbert Grandin's uh, print shop, located in the heart of the burgeoning canal-fed commercial district of Palmyra, right there on the uh, edge of the canal. That same year, Smith's Church of Christ, later known as the Latter-day Saints, officially formed uh, with a small but loyal assembly. 
interdenominational dispute followed, that religious excitation that he talked about sort of came back to bite him in some ways. And by 1831, uh, the other uh, four steeples basically didn't want another one, and uh, they uh, forced the young Mormon group out of town. They got on a canal boat, and they headed west, uh, heading to uh, the western lands of Ohio and ultimately to the um, further land of Utah. Brigham Young also, just a side note, was a canal-made man, and uh, much of his early life was spent living and working along the canal, and it was along the canal that he came across the Book of Mormon himself in 1832 and converted and actually caught up with, uh, caught up with the Mormons who had already begun going west. And Brigham Young then carried everyone into Utah. So Brigham Young was associated usually with Utah, Brigham Young University and bringing them in, but he's a canal person uh, as well originally. The Mormons weren't the only new religious group in the time directly influenced by the canal. In the uh, book A History of the American People, the historian Paul Johnson suggests that the Erie Canal is the outstanding example of a human artifact creating wealth rapidly in the whole of history. We can replace that phrase and suggest that the Erie Canal is the outstanding example of a human artifact creating new religious movements rapidly in the whole of history. Within two decades of its opening, this psychic highway, some people called it, cultivated extraordinary experimental groups such as the Mormons, the Adventists, spiritualism, in other words, communing with the dead through seances and the like, uh, a revived apocalypticism, utopian communal societies such as the Oneida community that you'll hear about in a couple weeks, uh, with the Amana colony and the Shakers also passing through this area, coming from England and Germany, settling here for a while, gaining momentum, and then also moving on from here. It also became a uh, home of the emotion-laden revivals of the Second Great Awakening. The canal also engendered religiously infused social movements of abolition, women's rights, and temperance. It's little wonder that the preacher Charles Finley named this area the burned over district. The idea was so many spiritual groups were going through here and burning up the area with sort of spiritual zeal and fire that there was sort of nothing left of the place. Um, this is a, it's a great uh, moniker, but it belays a deeper truth because out of the ashes rose a uniquely American faith that continues to exist into the present day. <coughs> Began in 1817 and completed in, in 1825, the Erie Canal stretched from Buffalo on the uh, edge of the Great Lakes to Albany at the, to the Hudson River with 83 locks in between. It was one of the greatest civil engineering feats in world history and made all the more amazing since there was little expertise and manners of engineering such grand project. From Albany, it was a quick 150 miles by steamboat to New York Harbor. Robert Fulton had, uh, not too long before, uh, created the great steamboat that allowed them quickly to get from Albany to, to New York City. And it was this aquatic connection that turned New York itself into a world-class city. Timber, salt, grain, and goods came from western New York to expand the lively seaport, basically to build. You know, you can't build a city without lumber, and they had <coughs> all the lumber came from western New York, went down the Kanawha, and built New York City. From 1820 to 1860, New York City's population increased by 700% over 40 years' time. Markets for New York City's goods opened up in the western regions uh, of the, and uh, went farther into the continent, of course, eventually. Now, the Erie Canal follows the only significant gap in the Appalachian mountain chain that goes from Maine to Georgia. This was a uh, geological fact that uh, George Washington and many of his contemporaries attributed to the, act of the good act of providence. It was providence. It was God who showed us this place. So you can see the uh, sort of gap here, the Appalachians pick up over here into Maine, into New England and Maine. And this is the only region, the only gap, the only navigable gap in the uh, entire chain that goes all the way down there. So if you're coming from Europe, uh, you know, everything happens by boat back in, uh, back in this time. So to get inland here, you'd have to go all the way down around Florida and then up the Mississippi, and then right, you're going upstream the Mississippi to get into the heartland. And the, and the steamboats really didn't uh, take off until the 1810s and 1820s going up the Mississippi until it made that uh, efficient. So this became the way inward, and especially from Europe. 
This navigable break, this narrow strip of land in a vast country was God's gift to the fledgling nation, inspiring citizens to move west, to push the frontier, and glean benefits from the natural riches of the continental interior. Intellectual ideas about manifest destiny flowed from the geographical realities of this place. And of course, we have to make clear that this is also cut through what was called the wilderness, but of course was uh, the land of the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois uh, nations who uh, lived here and whose basically land it cut uh, directly through as uh, they were continually uh, displaced uh, from their lands. This divine gift that the young Americans believed in uh, needed some improvements. Nature didn't give sort of an easy way. It wasn't, uh, there was too many portages and navigation of rapids along the way. It was navigable, but you had to portage for several miles at certain places to make it all the way into the uh, Great Lakes. So humans could improve on this already given uh, project. Um, New, York's, New York's governor, DeWitt Clinton, basically saw this through from the 1810s to the 1820s. They had uh, state bonds that paid for it, a few million dollars it cost. They raised it very quickly, came in under time, under budget, and uh, was paid off within a few years of opening the Erie Canal. Um, just sort of an amazing kind of uh, infrastructure work that's almost hard to believe uh, could happen today. And it's really this space, the reason why we're living right now in the Empire State. This was the Empire Builder. This was the reason uh, for Empire was because of the Erie Canal. Meanwhile, the political economic empire was inextricable, I'd suggest, from a spiritual empire. A land given by God comes with a serious set of responsibilities. Many European st settlers steeped in the Christian tradition saw the growing American continent not only as a new Eden, a place to, uh, to, to begin again, but also a new Jerusalem, a place that marks the end and the coming kingdom of God, which also meant the end of the world was soon at hand and there was a lot of work to be done before Jesus comes again. At the same time, they were freed from the shackles of church authorities that, uh, that dominated Old England and New England alike. This land along the canal provided ample possibilities for working out your salvation and ushering in the coming millennium, the reign of God's kingdom on earth. Apocalyptic fever ensued, setting up a series of self-styled prophets who believed themselves to be voices crying in the wilderness, like Jeremiah and St. John before them. Joseph Smith was one of these, and this is the reason the Mormons are the Latter-day Saints. Others like John Humphrey Noyes, you'll hear about the Oneida community soon, uh, responded by creating a utopian Christian community on the principles of biblical communism, meaning that all things were shared equally among members, including uh, children and spouses. The Noyes-led Oneida community was established in 1848 in the central region of the Canalway with a special building that hosted up to 300 members. Uh, much of their livelihood was based on ironworks and eventually becomes, as you might know, the Oneida uh, Silverware Company. Their ironworks uh, led to that, but that's what supported them. And again, it was this marketplace of the canal that opened up and allowed them to, to support themselves in this communal life. <clears throat> Noyes and Smith were careful not to be too specific about the coming into the world, but others not so much. Uh, around the same time up the Champlain Canal, a wheat farmer, turned Baptist farm, uh, wheat farmer turned Baptist minister named William Miller predicted the second coming of Jesus to occur on March 21st, 1843, based on his extensive study of the numerology of the Bible. That day came and passed. Nothing seemed to have happened, and so he revised his calculations, this time for October 22nd, 1844. The failed prediction led to what would become known as the Great Disappointment. Many of Miller's uh, numerous followers lost faith, at least in his cause, and turned to the Shakers and other rapidly growing Christian sects uh, for uh, connection. Others like Ellen G. White, one of the uh, followers of Miller at the time, took up where he left off, and the Adventist tradition was born through an Albany-based meeting in 1845. The Adventist sects that followed from this meeting were based on, among other things, uh, healthy bodies. Many groups promoted vegetarianism and an understanding of Jesus' imminent return. Again, the advent of the Adventists. Some of their followers went on to Battle Creek, Michigan to found the famous sanatorium there. And the Adventists today are one of the fastest growing traditions around the southern hemisphere of the world. 
With freedom comes responsibility, so prophets and preachers, teachers and activists endeavored to create a more equitable world in the here and now, inspiring each other to socio-religious work. The Canal Way of the 19th century was where former slaves and outspoken abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, they mingled and talked. The Canal made, made it possible for them to connect in a number of ways. Connected with women's rights activists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in Rochester and Seneca Falls. They all sought to articulate social applications for the religious roots of freedom and equality. Over in Syracuse, uh, Stanton and Anthony's colleague Matilda Jocelyn Gage, author of the great uh, mm. historical study Women, Church, and State, and uh, collaborated with, uh, Stanton, and, or with um, Stanton and uh, Anthony on a number of works as well. She also became, curiously enough, the mother-in-law of Frank Baum, who wrote the great uh, American utopian mythology, The Wizard of Oz. Stanton was also the cousin of the Utica native and Christian reformer Garrett Smith, who funded John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, promoted the Underground Railroad along the Erie Canal, and worked alongside Frederick Douglass in publishing anti-slavery newspapers in Syracuse and Rochester. And we could talk a lot about Gage as sort of this person with six degrees of separation to all these different happenings going on uh, in the area at the time. Uh, she also became uh, inducted into the, uh, the Mohawk uh, tribe and became uh, part of a clan member of uh, the Mohawk and uh, was really interested as she came from a Christian background and sort of railed against the patriarchy of that. She turned to the uh, Haudenosaunee traditions and found this sort of matriarchal uh, tradition sort of enlivening and enlightening for her and, and sort of sought to promote this uh, among, uh, among the people she knew. Smith, Douglas, Gage, and Stanton were but a few of the many who realized how print media could become vital to the spread of religious fervor and social reform. The Canal Way created, created notable new publishing venues that brought together many uh, ideas from the early republic. The most important preacher of the 19th century, Charles Finley, Char uh, sorry, Finney, uh, sparked revivals in canal cities uh, as part of the Second Great Awakening, right? Big revivals in Utica, Syracuse, uh, Rochester, and Buffalo. Um, tens of thousands of people would come out and, and listen to him, and converts uh, by, the, by the thousands were, were coming out. Um, and this is a very kind of unchurched time uh, as well. Very, a uh, lot of uh, you know, what we call today nuns, right, are unaffiliated. This was, uh, much of this land was, was quite unaffiliated at the time. It really is with the Second Great Awakening and some of these other movements that made it a uh, sort of uh, a religious place. William Miller's end of the time predictions wouldn't have remain, would have remained nothing but the rants of a local preacher were it not for the publishing work of Joshua Vaughn, Hines, and others. And over five million Millerite tracts and papers were estimated to have been distributed across the country. Many of these made accessible, again, through canal boats. Um, and just a year before Finney's massive revival in Rochester, a few miles down the canal, uh, Joseph Smith had 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon printed in Palmyra, right? That's a number that far exceeds the literate souls uh, in that town at the time. So he's thinking already transport, you know, moving, printing, shipping these things out uh, all over the place. And he saw that was possible through uh, what was going on with, uh, with the Erie Canal and how that changed communications. All these led all these activities led to a rapid rise in literacy rates in the young nation, which in turn created demand for more printed material, which various religious organizations gleefully helped supply, aided by efficient transportation across the canal. The commercial marketplace was also a spiritual marketplace. With literacy and publishing on the rise and an influx of new immigrants, the Erie Canal generated a symbiotic relation between the arts, education, and religious sensibilities. <coughs> So we had European writers like Alexis de Tocqueville and um, uh, Harriet Martineau coming and they traveled along the canal boats. They rode the canal boats and they talked with people and much of uh, Tocqueville's uh, great work on democracy in America comes from experiencing the canal way and meeting people along the way. Uh, they traveled the same canal boats that the American writers Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville did. M Melville starts out riding the canal boats and then turns to the big open ocean for Moby Dick. They came to different conclusions about the Young Republic and its religiosity, but uh, nonetheless, they were there. To f fill out the uh, kind of literary side of things, um, in the late, eight, late 1700s, uh, a young, uh, poor 
Irish immigrant settled in Albany. His name was William James, and uh, he became, began to buy up real estate in the Albany area. And as soon as the Erie Canal went in and all that land became super expensive, right, prices for this real estate rose, uh, he became a very rich man. And uh, from that, he um, had a great family, and some of you may know his, uh, his grandkids, right? Uh, William James, the great Harvard psychologist and philosopher, Henry James, the novelist, and Alice James, the novelist. So all of the James progeny all is also linked to the, uh, to the Erie Canal. Hudson River School painters like Asher Durand and uh, Thomas Cole found inspiration not just along the Hudson, they're usually called the Hudson River School painters, but they also traveled across the Erie Canal and found inspiration there. They traveled through the wilderness. Um, this was wilderness uh, at the time, and uh, Tocqueville and others have you know, just kind of hilarious ideas and, and comments about how they got off the canal boat and walked just a couple minutes off the canal and just were in the middle of nowhere and just freaked out. Um, just it was, uh, it's just they were not used to this kind of thing. So this canal boat, this canal way, you know, came across these sort of industrializing cities, but uh, right beyond it was, was still very much the wilderness. When the telegraph and railroad lines were established in the middle of the 19th century, the canal's influence began to decline. However, some of these new lines followed the routes of the canal and fed off what were deeply established urban areas by then. Canal towns became rail towns, and what were once new spiritual experiments became part of the establishment, primed and ready for export. The religious practices, behaviors, and belief that emerged in the second quarter of the 19th century in the canalway continued their influence into the western country. As the railroad and telegraph extended far into the American continent, they brought many of the innovative religious practices from the Erie Canal co Corridor into the new settlements. The Erie Canal became not only a great feat of civil engineering, but of civil communications. Like the Silk Road in Asia, the Incense Road in Arabia, and the Panama Canal in the Americas, the Erie Canal established physical links across geographic regions while actively reforming the social environments that spread out beyond their immediate transportation paths. New York's network of canals and cities, rivers and farmlands made the world smaller and more easily accessible than ever before. Newspapers and immigrants, novelists and painters, grain and lumber, suffragists and fleeing slaves, revivalists and new technology all traveled and lived on the canalway together, creating new connections and establishing unique currents of American religious life. This generated, in the words of Joseph Smith, an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. Thank you very much for listening.